My name is Sharon Whiteman, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to be here on behalf of the executive team of Lyme Disease Association of Australia and of all current and future Lyme patients in Australia. Uh, it's pretty difficult here in Australia for Lyme patients, and the topic of today is very timely, I believe. Um, Rachel and her mom, Dorothy, have both um, recently published a book jointly together about finding resilience, and definitely uh, that, that's a skill and a mindset, and we'll learn more about what their advice is in being resilient through trying to find treatment for Lyme and associated diseases in Australia. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit about both of their backgrounds before we get started. Rachel is a speech language pathology assistant who loved working with children. She's born and raised in Northern California and currently resides in the Pacific Northwest. These days, she is often found hiking, doing flying trapeze, and filming and edi editing videos documenting her life, which she features on her Instagram, Resiliently Rachel. Through her words and videos, Rachel seeks to inspire, educate, and offer a beacon of hope for those dealing with chronic illness. Her mother, Dorothy, is the president of LymeDisease.org, a national research and advocacy organization. She writes for the blog Touched by Lyme and spearheads public education efforts for LymeDisease.org. Co-author of the book, When Your Child Has Lyme Disease, A Parent's Guide to Survival, she frequently speaks to groups and the press about Lyme-related issues. Before she became involved in Lyme disease advocacy, she worked as a journalist and a political aide and wrote four books related to California history. She and her husband live in Northern California. So you can already diagnose me with Lyme because I'm switching words, so apologize <laughs> for that. Um, I know I read some of that backwards, but um, once again, thank you very much for giving us some of your time on a Sunday afternoon in, in the US. Okay, so, thank you for awesome, thank you. Um, so Rachel, let's go to the start. You're a healthy young athlete and then things started to go terribly wrong. Yeah, so um, I had been uh, an avid soccer player for uh, much of my childhood. And uh, when I was 13 years old, uh, for a couple of years before I was 13, I had a lot of knee pain when I was playing, especially when I was running. And that was just kind of something I dealt with a lot, but we didn't really have any answers to that. So we just kind of just assumed it was growing pains and we kept going. Um, but then when I was 13, I ended up falling in a soccer game and spraining my wrist, which just sort of set off a body-wide pain response. And within a couple weeks of spraining my wrist, I had so much knee pain, so much ankle pain that I ended up on crutches. And then just a couple weeks later, I ended up in a wheelchair and we were very confused because I had only hurt my wrist when I had fallen in soccer but that was like not even the biggest problem that we were dealing with. And so then we ended up just going to a whole bunch of doctors trying to figure out what was wrong. I know that journey well. And Dorothy, how was that feeling for you as a mother when, when all this was happening? Well, one of the things that I realize now is that living in California, particularly that it, it, Lyme disease wasn't even on the radar screen for the doctors that we, uh, you know, consulted with. And that's actually, this was, you know, what, 15 plus years ago, and it hasn't changed that much since, particularly when somebody doesn't have a known tick bite, doesn't have a bullseye rash or the other kinds of symptoms that are considered, you know, oh yeah, that's Lyme disease. This was just just a bunch of weird, uh, you know, weird symptoms. And she also had um, like like one one time, one foot would be really hot to the touch and the other one would be ice cold. And there was migrating pain, which actually is a, a, a symptom of Lyme disease, a sign of Lyme disease is if, you know, one day one elbow hurts, the next day the other elbow hurts. And what we found with that, that doctors would say that, that that was proof that you weren't really sick. If you were saying you changed your story, you know, yesterday you said it was this and today you said it was that. So it was a very confusing time. She was, she was in junior high and it was, you know, she wanted to go to school and she wanted to play with her friends and she was just in a lot of pain and we were getting nowhere with the doctors. And so it was just a very confusing, painful time for the whole family. And I imagine, Rachel, you saw many doctors during that time. What was that like? 
Yeah, well, I mean, at first we we kind of were treating it like a really weird sports injury um, and we couldn't figure it out, but neither could the doctors. And so we just kind of kept going to different sports related doctors. And then we started branching out from there. And I mean, it was just, it took a, a lot of time out of school and a lot of tests and blood tests. And that became normal later on. But at the beginning, it was very, you know, jarring and you're not used to not used to doing all of that, but um, but then it, it started out from we're trying to find what's going on to then it started just being a lot more dreadful going to doctors because they changed and they started. What? Well, I was just going to say that, that that at one point, you know, initially we were going with that wrist injury and they did an MRI of the wrist. And according to the results, there was nothing wrong. And at that point, they started looking at us differently and it wasn't you know you know it, it was like oh there's you know she's making it up the mother is enabling her and it just became this whole weird situation with going to the doctors and yet that they were the ones that were supposed to help us and so it was it was just a very it was it was just a it was a very confusing difficult time and at that time we didn't know anything about Lyme disease we didn't know anything about any of that stuff and it was just it it was 2005 you know Facebook didn't exist yet Twitter didn't exist yet all of the ways that a lot of people get information now didn't exist then. Mm. And in there, there were, I remember looking up books on Amazon once when I finally got on track to be trying to find out things about Lyme disease, there was barely anything on Amazon about Lyme disease. And there was very little that was, there was, that was on the internet even. And, and what little was there wasn't very helpful. <laughs> and so it was just, just a very, very, very difficult time. I can imagine. And so what was it like, you know, to navigate daily life at that time? I know, you know, mentioned to me that there, there was wheelchairs involved and not really set up for that at home and school. What was, must have been very daunting. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, when I went into the wheelchair, uh, that became, uh, a challenge at home because it was really hard to move the wheelchair around like down the hallway to then turn it into my bedroom that like couldn't happen with the wheelchair and so I would use an office chair at home and either kind of push myself a wheeled office like chair. a wheeled office chair um and uh and I'd either push myself or have my parents or brother kind of help me push me around but we had a lot of carpet so we had to get that ripped up and put hard floor in so that I could get around um, and at the time, we didn't know if we were ripping up all this carpet for a really quick, you know, quick fix for me down the line, but it ended up being years in the wheelchair. Um, and so that's how I got around our house for three and a half years. Um, but yeah, so it was a, it was a very, very uh, everything up in the air kind of experience. And we found uh, just going to public places that that uh, a lot of places that claim to be wheelchair accessible aren't really, <laughs> or that there are there are barriers that are put in your way, uh, you know, trash cans that block the hallway. And uh, one time we were in a uh, like a dressing room of a of a department store, and we were in in the dressing room, in the wheelchair dressing room. <laughs> and somebody put some, didn't know we were in there and, and put some shopping carts that blocked our ability to get out. <laughs> we were like trapped in the dressing room of Target. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, you know, so there were those kinds of things. And then there was just a 13 year old girl that was in serious pain and her mom couldn't take the pain away even though we, we tried and we went to uh, lots of doctors and we tried they tried sort of standard painkillers that didn't do anything in including um Take it in. you know opioids yeah <laughs> opioids that uh that just didn't do anything and it's and so they made her sick to her stomach made her sleepy but they didn't take the pain away mm -hmm. and the doctors would again use that as proof 
Well, if she was really in pain, that, that pill would have helped and it didn't help. So, so there you are. <laughs> so again, come, comes back to she's faking it or at the very least exaggerating greatly. And so it was a very, um, a, you know, it was just a very difficult, just a, just very difficult from the family dynamics. And I can only imagine that in Australia, where I think it's, you know, there's, there's a lot more challenges that uh, I, I just think that that relationship between parent and child, where you're trying to help this child feel better and you're doing the best that you can and the system isn't helping you and then the child is having her own reactions to things it's just um it, it's just it's just very it's very hard yeah the le level of gaslighting that doctors can do can be one breathless really like it's it's inconceivable really the pain and the suffering that's caused by just not listening and not believing and I know you had a few rough experiences at school as well Rachel what was that like for you yeah well um when I had first got in the wheelchair I mean school had always been I love school like I always loved school um and I got along with pretty much everybody uh but then I got into the wheelchair and then I noticed that some things changed and there was one specific girl we talk about her in, in our memoir um that just really seemed to take it personally that I was in a wheelchair and showing up in a wheelchair at school and she just kind of made it her mission to make me feel bad about it as often as she could and it's sad because I just had one person doing that to me but it was really it's really jarring when you're being kind of verbally attacked throughout your school day and I know a lot of people have it a whole lot worse with bullying um, and so that's a the kind of an added layer that I definitely noticed different from my childhood dealing with Lyme than you know adults dealing with Lyme have their own issues but that bullying layer when you're a kid um, it's just another another layer on top of everything and she didn't tell me about it at the time. I didn't find out about it until really literally month, well, the following school year. And so, so some of that is, you know, she's trying to make things uh, on her own way and make her own decisions about things and, and not telling us. And I, you know, I thought I knew what was going on. I thought I had a handle on things. And I did not realize that that this one person was really really making her life miserable when she was at school. And I have since heard that um, from other kids with, you know, from their parents, but I mean, other kids with Lyme disease often have that situation where uh, it's on, and, and, and other, <laughs> you know, obviously bullying can happen for a lot of different things, but yeah. uh, you know, kid, kid in a wheelchair going through, through health challenges that that's just really, um, you know, just, just, just one more, one more bad thing that happened. Mm. I'm sorry that happened to you, Rachel. Um, it's, you know, it's kids, <laughs> kids deserve everything, don't they? It's such a formulating time in life. So how did you put things together that it could be Lyme disease? Cause you didn't have a tick bite as a guiding light. Well, uh, I would I tell you, it was we had been doing research. I'd been reading things about pediatric pain. I'd been, you know, trying to find anything that I could. And actually, a neighbor of ours, in just a chance conversation, this was fairly early in the process, you know, had heard that Rachel was having these issues and said to me, uh, "Have you ever thought about Lyme disease?" Because he and his wife knew somebody that had a similar situation and turned out to be Lyme disease. And I went right in and Googled it and there wasn't a lot of information about it. And what was on there was contradictory. And I called the doctor that we were currently seeing was a rheumatologist and, and left a message with the nurse that I was wondering, you know, what, what is it, the possibility of Lyme disease? And she called me back and she said, oh, she asked the doctor and she said uh, that it wasn't necessary to test for Lyme disease. And I said, why is that? And he, she said, because she doesn't have Lyme disease. 
And <laughs> that was just over the phone. And when we had the, then actually my husband and I went in to talk to him without Rachel. And, uh, and we were asking him about that. And he just said, absolutely, you know, flat out that it couldn't possibly be Lyme disease. And I said, how did you know that? And he said, um, cause there's no Lyme disease around here. And I said, well, we don't spend all our time here. We've traveled, we've gone other places, we camp, we hike. And he just kept saying, nope, nope, no, nope, no Lyme disease around here. And I thought that was weird at the time. And then later when I got involved in, in Lyme disease advocacy, I found that that's a very common experience and not just in California, even in parts of the US, even, even in, Connecticut, where it was first identified in Lyme, Connecticut, that I had talked to people that said that they went to their doctor and their doctor didn't even want to test them, you know, just said, no, 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 it's not Lyme disease. And so there, I believe in a lot of ways, there is, there is now more, more recognition on some levels in the U.S. with, uh, you know, on health websites and, you know, movie stars that have Lyme disease and that kind of thing. That that has raised awareness in a lot of ways, but still at the retail level of somebody going in and saying, I don't feel well, I have these random health issues. Uh, I still think there's an awful lot of people where Lyme disease is not considered part of the differential diagnosis and it should be yeah any multi-system symptoms shouldn't it should be <laughs> first step, step one step one come on wake up talk right. and what was what did you how did you find your way to a Lyme literate or Lyme aware doctor well I'll tell you it was uh Lyme online online Lyme support groups and there was something that was called California Lime. It was a Yahoo group. And uh, there were, I found myself there and, and started educating myself by think what things were, you know, people were posting. And, and we found um, some names of, of doctors and the groups wouldn't post names because, you know, they, they, uh, want to be private about that because sometimes you know charges are brought against doctors and but but we found some names and everybody had a waiting list of the ones that we contacted but uh, we got on their you know got on their cancellation list and we got a call uh, that that the, there had been a cancellation. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and it was about a two two hour drive from our house. And we said we'll take it, and that that got us that got us started on that on that journey. And that's often life changing, and um, sort of I can remember feeling incredulous when somebody believed me. What did you feel like, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, it was it was like incredible. I still I really remember that day. I mean, like I'm 32 and I was like 13, turning just turned 14 when I got diagnosed. And um, and I remember going in and being there with the doctor, and like he spent two hours and just really listened and was like taking notes. I never really seen someone take notes about what I was saying and what my mom was saying, and like he just really listened and it was just so different than every other doctor's appointment I had like ever been to. And, um, and then at the end he was saying he wanted to do tests, but he highly suspected I had Lyme and it, I mean, we were like on cloud nine. It was like, it was amazing. We were like, we've got this it, because just having a diagnosis after at that point, like nine months or a bunch of months of just being told I was making it up. I wanted attention. I wanted to be out of school and off out of soccer or whatever, you know, like I, like it was just months of being told that I was wrong. And then now one person believed that I was right. And that meant so much. Mm. And did you have high hopes at that time? What was the next phases? I mean, I felt like 
yeah, we got it. The, the yeah. hardest part is over. We got the <laughs> diagnosis and we're just, I mean, he had told us that it was going to be hard uh, moving forward. But at that moment, I had no understanding of what that actually was about to mean. And then very shortly after that elation, we just kind of dropped real big with my first Herx reaction. And then it just kind of went downhill from there for quite a while. And I know, did you have some more experiences with psych even after being with the Lyme literate doctor? Yeah, so we um, we got the diagnosis in November of 2005 and then started antibiotics and started treatment. And then I just got so much worse. And mentally, my mental health really tanked at the same time as my physical health tanked. And by this point, I was in a hospital bed in my bedroom all the time because I couldn't sit up straight or lay down flat and still be able to breathe comfortably. So I had to be at a very specific reclined angle. So I was out of school and just everything was falling apart. And I just became very, very depressed and it just got really, really dark. And so a little bit after Christmas in January, it just kind of all blew up. And we talk a, talk in detail in, the, in our memoir about uh, I ended up on a 72 hour hold in a psych hospital. And, um, and that was a whole adventure and it's in itself there. And, and that hospital uh, also didn't, didn't believe that she really had Lyme disease and didn't, I was there uh, when she was being admitted and I had brought all of the medications and, you know, gave information about, you know, her medical background. And I really wanted her to be able to continue to take the antibiotics while she was there. And they were first saying no. And, and you know, the, the head person was saying that, well, he used to be a doctor in Connecticut. And so he knew all about Lyme disease and this wasn't Lyme disease. And it was, uh, you know, one of the one of the psych techs that talked to to my husband and me at one point was telling me that oh she's just she's just pulling the wool over your eyes she's just conning you all you know there's nothing wrong with her she's just doing this for attention and it was really uh, it was it was really a, a very very difficult situation and we got her out of there after the 72 hours but she was still horribly depressed and suicidal and so it was a long it was a long journey back from there and um, something that I do discuss in the book uh, the person I you mentioned I had previously written a book I had co-written a book uh, called um, When Your Child Has Lyme Disease, A Parent's Survival Guide. And I co-wrote that with Sandra Berenbaum, who is a Lyme literate family therapist in Connecticut. And she specializes in helping families who are dealing with Lyme disease. That's, that's her specialty. And our doctor, our Lyme doctor, had given us her contact information. And this was, you know, now a lot of people do remote, uh, you know, therapy and that sort of thing. But at that time that, you know, I was thinking, well, what, how does it help us that there's, that I talked to somebody in, in Connecticut, you know, the other side of the country. And uh, she uh, actually was very helpful. She was very helpful to us. And one, I called her the first time when, when Rachel was in the hospital, the, the psych hospital. And um, she, one of the first things she said was, you need a plan. <laughs> and it was that, that, you know, we discussed this and, you know, what, what does Rachel need? One of the first questions I asked her, I was thinking if we could find uh, some kind of a, a, of a facility that Rachel could go to, to get the treatment that she needed. And she said at that time that she was not aware of a facility in the entire United States mm -hmm. that would continue Lyme disease treatment while you were getting mental health treatment. And so I was like, well, what do we do? 
And she said, you've got to do it. You've got to, you've got to be the hospital. You have to make your home the hospital and you have to make it be safe for her. And you need to have her get the treatment that she needs. And it seemed like um, a very steep, steep hill to climb, but uh, we, we got to work and we ultimately did it. And one of the things that was very helpful was Rachel already had a local therapist that she was seeing. Uh, and, and that woman was very good at dealing with teenage girls and, and their various issues, but she didn't know anything about Lyme disease. And so Sandy, the other therapist, consulted with her over the phone, sort of trained her over the phone how to deal with Rachel. And I really, we, I think we all feel like that was one of the important, most important things that we did for her, in addition to all of the, the medical treatment. But just medical treatment alone, just giving, just giving medication alone is not what a, a teenage girl that's having, you know, mental problems associated with tick-borne diseases, because it wasn't just Lyme disease, it turned out to be Bartonella and Babesia as well, which can, those can all affect the brain. And, uh, and so it was, anyway, that was a, that was a very important uh, part of, of the finding resilience. <laughs> was the formula. Very, very, very important part of the formula was mm. was dealing with that with that mental aspect of it as well as the psychological aspect of it as well as the as the medical care. Mm. Um, my worst Herx experiences responses were suicidal depression. It's it's horrifying. It's very 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 scary and very real. And you know I'm a former ICU nurse, and it's it's beyond comprehension that the psych professionals never think of why what's going on in the brain you know they don't think of causation they just go into historic treatment and it's 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 inconceivable really and 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 i have a lot of criticism for our healthcare system from my perspective so i'm so glad that you know you found the right people to bring that forward in a positive way so how about the rest of the family i know you mentioned that you know I mean, Lyme, we're doing we're focusing on two families this may and it just affects everybody every single member mm -hmm. well um rachel do you want to talk about your brother or <laughs> um, yeah so i have an older brother jeremy four years older than me and it was an interesting time when i got sick because i got sick right as he was graduating from high school and moving away to college and so we all, my mom, my dad, and I all viewed that as perfect timing because he could just go out and be in the world and just be free and do his own thing while we were all at home just drowning and trying to stay afloat. Um, and so I had always, like if someone had asked me like, oh, did this affect Jeremy? I had always thought for years after I had gotten better, like, nah, he was totally fine. He was out of the picture. And then when I was in college, I was doing a research paper for one of my psychology classes. Uh, and I specifically chose how chronic illness affects the siblings of the chronically ill child. Um, and part of that, my professor had said, oh, you know, interview, you know, your brother and stuff. So I remember sitting on the counter and being like, you know, Jeremy, you weren't really impacted like this. We don't really count. Right. Because you were gone. And that's when he opened up and was you know, saying, what are you talking about? Like he was off at college, completely left alone in his mind, completely left alone by himself while we were off doing God knows what at our house. And he felt very lonely and like the dynamic completely changed when he'd come home, everything revolved around me and my health needs and everything was very different. And, um, and so it was so interesting years after the fact to realize that like he was impacted in a big way as well. Cause then later I went off to college and I was calling my parents like multiple times a day. And it was like, it was a huge part of my college experience is being able to reach out and have them be you know, close virtually at least. And, and then to like 
think about what it was like for him when he left to just go long periods of time with no support that's uh mm -hmm. it makes us kind of look back and realize stuff well I feel really bad about that and I you know there were times because I've talked to him about it afterwards too and that he was you know on top of everything else he was scared he was scared for us and there was so much that was going on with her with the psych hospital and whatever that and herxing and you know schlepping to you know medical appointments that were two hours away and everything that it was just like my whole day was filled up just dealing with that. And we did talk to Jeremy once in a while on the phone or whatever, but it wasn't. And he, you know, he came home for holidays, but it was just, it, it, it really, I mean, I realized in retrospect that it really kind of shut him out. And I have talked through the years, I have talked to other people where sometimes the siblings basically, you know, when they grow up, there was one one situation that I was aware of that the that the the non-sick child basically just said she was divorcing the family. She just mm -hmm. felt like, you know, you guys are just paying all your attention to that kid and I'm going off and doing my own thing. And there was a lot of pain on all sides there. Mm -hmm. And and um I don't know in that specific case, you know, I don't have an update on what happened, but I remember at the time that it was very, it was very, very hard. And, and they, you know, I hear stories of people and certainly, you know, children with cancer, this kind of thing, you know, happens a lot where that one kid is getting everything that the parents are capable of doing. And some of the other kids are just, you know, just, just around the fringes. And, from the parents' point of view, there's only so many hours in the day and you only have so much energy and you only have so much money. And, you know, it's, it's the, you know, you do, you do what you have to do to get through. And unfortunately, sometimes certain family members end up getting the short end of the stick. That must be very hard for both of you, you know, not to mention Je Jeremy, but to be, recognizing this in retrospect, um, what yeah. he might have been going through. It's very human, isn't it? The whole experience of Lyme in families is just so humanizing. It just breaks it into the raw <laughs> structure of everything, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Right. And so, you know, we've spoken about the importance of the family therapist and that teamwork there. What other kinds of things do you did you realize and like you know I know you mentioned online support groups and the increase of virtual connection these days and especially for disabled limeys um, that's sometimes the only way they have connection. What what was your experience with that? So I was very lucky in that I we lived in a wonderful neighborhood. They still live there, um, and I had a whole group of friends. Uh, that lived just like on my street and the next street over and just like all around us. And so I had grown up with these friends. So then when I got sick, they just, instead of us playing outside and climbing trees and going and doing other stuff, they just came into my bedroom and would sit next to my bed and we would play games and card games and, you know, video games and stuff. And we would make videos and we just kind of made our life about being in my bedroom mm -hmm. and I was really lucky to have all of those friends already solidified before I got sick because otherwise it's very hard to find friends when you're already sick and not able to go out um, and do anything and so all throughout my three and a half years when I was bedridden and in a wheelchair um, my friends would come over and that was like a lifeline for me that was very, very important. I talk about all of those friends in the book and I'm still very good friends with all of them today and stuff. So I know that that is definitely not the story for a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people find that once they get sick, their friends all fade to the background. But I was very lucky uh, that that didn't happen for me. And of course, online things um, were really just beginning. What was it? Yeah. Uh, messenger aim or something aim aol messenger aol messenger yeah. that was that she could sometimes do that with people and there was there was some kind of a, a group similar group for lime teens that mm -hmm. you did for a few times 
but um, but now with with Facebook and other social media platforms, there are um, you know there there are opportunities for people to make some kind of a connection, but that's still hard to do for 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 young kids and all you know they're they're periodically are you know there's people that support groups that may start some kind of a thing. Um, you know, a Zoom meeting for, for um, you know, for children or young people. And, but a lot of times that'll be for a while and then they'll fade out. You know, it isn't, it isn't there, it, it isn't there all the time. Now it's, it's not for children, but there is an organization called Generation Line that does a lot of meetups for young people and, um, other groups, um, you know, for Lyme related, you know, people of color or other, I forget what some of the other groups are. Uh, but, but so that, they, so those, those are mechanisms for some people to make, to make a connection, but it's, um, now your organization does something called lunch. What is it? Limey Limey, lunch? Limey lunch. <laughs> right. I've seen, I've seen the announcements yeah. about that. But I assume that's not children. I assume that's no, adults. No, it's not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've been doing that for four years, and I think in Australia there's um, several very successful and supportive online uh, Facebook groups where there's lots of archives, and you can search on questions or just pop in any time of the day. And then there's some state-based groups that are very strong as well. So, you know, to the best of our ability, we link arms with and support all, all the actions of Lyme patients who are reaching out to have mechanisms and structures to support people. Because I tell you, you need support through this. There's, you know, I had many dark times and um, we've got someone right now going through a really tough time um, with an added layer of more gallons onto um, that mm -hmm. person's picture and it's it, you know everybody has to link arms at times like that when it becomes a crisis families and online friends so it's I, and I think would you agree with me um, Rachel and Dorothy that people actually should make sure they have at least a backup virtual support system when they're launching into um, treating and recovering from Lyme and associated diseases oh absolutely absolutely yeah. uh, because you just you know on the um LymeDisease.org has something that they call uh, U.S. National Lyme Group, but actually, uh, you know, we we wouldn't turn somebody out if they weren't in the U.S. But I mean, that's just the way yeah. the thing was set up. Yeah. And uh, there's people periodically that'll that'll say, "I'm just starting out on this, and I'm going to start doing this, and I'm scared, and what do I do?" and you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. I don't, I, I don't read every message that's on there, but I, you know, kind of, you know, try to keep aware of what's happening and people will be very supportive. People will be very supportive and say, well, okay, first you wanted to do this and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And some, it's just now there, there is, there can be a problematic side of online groups. I think, our group, because it's not on Facebook or not, you know, there's sort of some layers you have to go through to get to it. Um, I I don't see the the real negativity, but some of the some of the Facebook groups and other things, if you're not careful, there's there can be um, a lot of um, negativity and maybe maybe fake inf you know false information. And so, so you, you know, you have to be careful. You have to be careful about it. But I found, um, you know, the online groups that I was involved with in the beginning to be just extremely. It was just vital. That was just how I, how I found out anything. And in fact, was really that experience that really brought me into now that I'm involved with Lyme disease.org in, in really starting to have a lot of information, news blogs and the Facebook page and that kind of thing of, and the support group of trying to get information available to people and accurate information. 
And, and because I just remember just not being able to find out anything and that there was very little, uh, there was little way to find out if there was something. Now, Dr. Um, Dr. Jones, Dr. Charles Ray Jones was, uh, he passed away some years ago. He was a very celebrated case in the US where they took his license away for treating people, you know, children with Lyme disease. With, with antibiotics. And there was this whole, there was a, you know, court case and all this stuff going on. And there wasn't any way to get any information about it. And the newspapers didn't particularly do anything, you know, to, to maybe the, once in a while, there'd be a little article someplace. And I really wanted to have, to have a way where people could find information about Lyme disease in in a lot of different ways and if there was something new if there was you know a court case or whatever I really wanted there to be a place to go to and just on Facebook uh, in the last week uh, somebody was referring to our organization and he called us the CNN of Lyme disease <laughs> and I thought yeah, that's what, yeah, we're the CNN of Lyme disease. And so I, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of different opinions. There's a lot of, you know, we try to get a little bit of everything out there. And once in a while, I, I believe, didn't some years ago, you wrote, you wrote a, a blog for us. Didn't, didn't yes, you? you did. Yeah. 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 Our organization. I'm not the writer. Okay. My brain's pretty impacted, but I can still talk. <laughs> yeah. But but um, you know we your well certainly your organization we has you've, we've published things by you guys. We try to get there's a lot of different advocacy groups now. We try to include their voices in what we do, and so uh, so anyway, I'm getting a little bit far afield there, but. But, I'll uh, just add one thing in that you're talking about the politics and sometimes things aren't perfect online. And if anybody bumps up against that, we had, you know, there is a lot, even inter-organizational politics, patient to patient politics, probably doctor to doctor politics. I'm not too involved in that, but what I had, we had a, <clears throat> a Lyme patient support program for a few years. We had a government grant. We asked for a lot of things and they just gave us money for counseling and we were going to refuse it. And then we thought, well, people need, do need counseling. It's just that it's not what our priority was. And um, long story short, in regards to that politics, I asked this, you know, this counselor that we engaged, um, they worked with us for about a year and a half and just were so just mind blown at what patients go through in, in at the hands of healthcare in this country. Long story short, she said to me, I said, it was just so much politics. I was having a particularly difficult time. And she goes, Sharon, wherever there's trauma, there's politics. You know, mm -hmm. and then with Lyme patients, you add an inflamed brain. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like um, extraordinary. So people need to understand. And, and I think, you know, you just walk away and understand that we're all walking through a journey that's very difficult and people are struggling to survive and just hold your head high, be kind and collaborative the best with those that want to, you know, and, in that same topic, same as patients, right? There's no, was this your experience? There's not really one right treatment pathway for every patient. It's so yeah. natural to think this worked for me. You got to do this. Yes. But Which is why, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I was going to say that's why, like, every time, like, so I share a lot. We do advocacy in different ways, my mom and I, but my thing is mostly sharing my story on Instagram and using different hashtags to try to get, you know, people to, that are interested in Lyme or whatever to be able to find me. Um, and that's why I am always so clear about this is what I did, but I am not saying this is the right thing. This is not going to work for everybody because yeah, sometimes you will also see people posting like, well, this is what you do. And then this, and it's like, everyone's so different. And, and there's definitely not just one right thing, sadly, um, for everybody yeah. got to try it all. So yeah, we have definitely definitely noticed that we've done our best to try it all <laughs> in, the, in the journey to get better. We have tried a whole bunch of the options. And what would either of you like to say if you had your time uh, to health policymakers and, and medical colleges? Believe the patient. <laughs> That's what I would say. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like literally that simple. If at the beginning, 
if the doctors that I went to just decided to believe what I was saying, then that would have taken off making it up and wanting attention. That would have taken those off the table. And then you would be like, you know, the doctors and the TV shows that are like, okay, let's figure this out. And then you would eventually figure it out. So, I mean, I think just believing that when anybody comes into your office saying that they're in pain, even if they are a healthy looking 13 year old sitting in a wheelchair, just believe them by default. And because mm. who are you hurting by believing? You know? Yeah, good point. Dorothy? Well, there's certainly a lot of things that need to happen um, in terms of medical schools and and just health policy. And certainly in, in the United States, uh, a really big barrier has been the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the IDSA, which puts out Lyme disease guidelines. Well, they put out guidelines for all kinds of things, but the contentious thing, contentious things for us is the Lyme disease guidelines, which basically take away uh, doctor clinical judgment, take away options for Lyme disease. And they, uh, you know, this has been going on for years now. And, uh, and but the, the good things are that, that research, younger, newer researchers are coming along and looking into things. And there is a movement towards uh, better testing. And there's, there's movement towards a lot of things. And so, you know, I was uh, lucky enough to be in the audience of a very interesting workshop that was in Washington, D.C. last June. It was sponsored by the uh, NASM, National uh, Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And they were looking at it. A lot of this was driven by COVID, but they were looking at what they call infection-associated chronic conditions. There may be another, it's, 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 it's a long acronym. There might be another word in there. But basically, long COVID and Lyme disease and um, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Emmy, and other things like that have a lot of overlapping symptoms, something that is, you know, there there's commonalities in all of those. They, they're not identical. They're not identical, but there are commonalities. And this particular workshop was geared towards getting researchers from those different places to start looking at the bigger picture. And so that that was very heartening to me and, mm. and other, other people in the, in the Lyme community. And so that... That kind of thing, uh, we're going forward. You know, I think the the country. When I say we, I think the, the health system is 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 making some strides in those directions. And but but much more of it is needed. And um, and again, I think I said this earlier in the conversation. You know, on the on the retail level, one person going into their doctor, they still Unfortunately, I think a lot of times those doctors are still still using the mindset from their medical school training twenty years ago, and yeah. and you know the doc the the information that they're given to work with um, often is sadly uh, is is lacking in Lack ways that yeah. help the the patients, and so. Uh, Lots more work needs to happen. And data, I, I interviewed Dr. Elam um, this month, and she's mm -hmm. talking about the impact of, there's a couple, two different major patient or Lyme aware organizations driving data collection, and it's showing to conflict with the CDC data. And that's bringing awareness as well and sort of breaking news in a way. Were you aware of that? Well, my Lyme data is one of the programs that my organization uh, does. Yes. <laughs> so, so we're 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 one of what she was talking about, 
and and um it is a it was started now again it's it's just for the united states because these kinds of things are complex and it's it's easier to do it <laughs> for, for one country but it's basically a patient registry where an individual like Rachel was one of the first people to sign up for it when we started it uh, nine years ago. And a patient signs up for it and then asks and answers questions about their personal experience. Uh, did they know a, that were they aware of a tick bite? Did they have a bullseye rash? Uh, how many doctors did they see before they they got a Lyme disease diagnosis? What kind of treatments have they done? And it, it's it's much more complex than that. That's just that that's just a few examples. And and uh, we work with uh, academic um, statisticians and things at like uh, UCLA and the University of Washington and some other academic uh, places. And they analyze the data. And we have like um, we have more than eighteen thousand people who have signed up so far, and awesome. one of like an example of what they've found is that there's a very large difference between women's experience having Lyme disease and men's experience having Lyme disease, and women are more likely they take longer to get diagnosed, and they. Um, have different kinds of symptoms and are more likely to develop persistent Lyme disease. And so are those, nobody's ever asked those questions before about Lyme disease. And so is it, is it because when women go to the doctor, the doctors don't believe them? And so is that why it's harder to get diagnosed? Or is there a biological reason why it's harder to get diagnosed? And I mean, I think there's a wide continuum of answers for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not one thing, but looking at um, you know no no Lyme disease studies had ever in you know taken a, a look at um, you know men versus women in terms of Lyme disease, and there's so that's not the only question, but I mean that that's just an example of the kinds of things now other diseases um cancer and heart disease there you know up until a few years ago they were heart studies were never done were never done on women they were only yeah. done on men so all of the information about Lyme disease I mean about heart disease was yeah. how it affected men it was skewed and yeah. you know and so it's uh there are things that are different some mm -hmm. things hormones you know could be but anyway those those kinds of things that there are um, patient registries, many of them are run by the government by through the uh, uh, National Institutes of Health or the CDC um, Centers for Disease Control. And but they never did anything for Lyme disease. And mm -hmm. so my organization about uh, we're coming up on 10 years ago said, you know what, we're going to do this. And so we have had, I believe it's seven um, journal articles, uh, medical journal articles, the scientific journal articles that have been um, based on information from my line data. And there okay. are other, um, just there are researchers that are interested in, you know, pursuing questions that 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 our studies have raised. So it really is, um, uh, that's something to be, you know, I think it's, it's hopeful. It, it, it yeah. may not uh, solve somebody's problem tomorrow, but it's starting to move the needle in the right direction. Yeah, it's hopeful for patients and, and really a foundation for informing research priorities, isn't it? Uh, we did a survey in 2012 and 2014, and, and um, with the worsening situation in Australia, uh, we've realized that government's not going to do it, so we're reinstating our data collection this year as well. And, and we are inspired by my Lyme data, so, you know, thank goodness for the pioneers going first. Um, and so bringing it back to, to Rachel and resilience, so, you know, what would... Your, your book is Finding Resilience, and I, I, there, it's just indescribable how much resilience a Lyme patient needs to face the treatment and recovery journey. 
what's your experience? What's your advice? So um, my advice uh, would be something that we have definitely talked a lot about. It's it's so important to find something that brings you joy that you can do right now. And that was something that like we as a family worked on all throughout my sickest years um, of finding things that I could do, which was back then it was filming and editing videos. Um, and I could do that from my hospital bed in my room and just finding something that you can do that just truly brings you joy because that is, dealing with Lyme disease takes a long time and it's great to have goals for the future and be like, in the future, I'm going to do this. But if you just keep being like, well, in the future, I'm going to do all these things that bring me joy. That's like sometimes not enough. And so I, I definitely encourage people to find something that you can do, whether it's coloring or painting or listening to audiobooks, you know, just something that brings you joy because that um that can mean the difference between, you know, making it making it through a really rough day. So that's something that I always try to I talk about that on my Instagram page, resiliently Rachel. Um and I just I think that's really important to find something that that makes you happy. Yeah, awesome. Would you add to that, Dorothy? Well I think in terms of of particularly a child, uh, something we were talking about earlier today, that, you know, your kids, this is their childhood, whether, you know, healthy, unhealthy, whatever, this is, this is their childhood until something changes. And you want them to have happy memories of their childhood. And so we really worked a lot. We were, as she mentioned, we were lucky to have friends nearby that she could do things with. And we were very grateful to them that they that they stuck with her through the years. We also planned family celebrations and we played games and we, you know, had people come visit for the holidays and Sometimes, depending on, you know, you can't always do that if the if the person is too sick, but it, it was always important to us to to try to, you know, it's like life, you know, we, we, we want this to be worthwhile and we want this to be a happy memory. And so I think that Rachel, despite everything she's been through, I think she has happy memories of her childhood. Yes, so, we were talking about that this morning. I just, <laughs> I was making a video that's going to go up uh, for Lyme Awareness Month in May, and um, and so we're I was, we we're talking about that. Was the whole premise of the video is you know this is your the kid's childhood, so have a childhood as as best you can. It might look different than other people's, but it will always be what your childhood is. And so I was saying that even though things were also very very hard, when I look back at my childhood we did so much and my mom did so much to make things as good as they could be that when I look back, the first thing I think of is all of the happy things. Mm, that's awesome. And Dorothy, what would you advise for parents of a Lyme disease child? Well, echoing what Rachel said earlier, believe your child, because I certainly hear from a lot of people um, particularly lots of times it's the dads that don't seem to believe the mom does, but it's like, oh, you know, they can, they can just buck up. They'll be okay. <laughs> and I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on the dads and, and uh, Rachel's dad of my husband really, you know, was a very important part of the team. But I think it's important to um, I think it's important to, to believe your child, recognize what your child needs. I think it's important to get support for yourself uh, through, you know, whatever is available to you. And, you know, it could be therapy, it could be support group. Uh, and it's important to have information. And I always pitch to people that they should sign up for the free newsletter that's available from LymeDisease.org. I realize you guys have a almost the same uh, email that we do, but we go, I mean, not email, uh, the yeah, website. URL, yeah. Right. And, uh, but we call ourselves LymeDisease.org. 
And, and you can go to our homepage and sign up for the newsletter. And we, you know, we put out information about a lot of things. And certainly we have people in Australia that, that uh, subscribe to our newsletter. Yeah. They're most welcome to do that. You know, you can see things where they'll show you online. Oh, like sometimes Facebook and sometimes Google, they'll actually show you the country maps of where people are reading our blogs and that kind of thing. And awesome. we we have a fair number of them in Australia. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would, that that's one way for people to get information. There's certainly um, a lot of good books that have come out recently. And uh, when we were going through this, there really hadn't been books that were oriented to patients you know they were there were medical books of some sort uh but like dr horowitz came out with his book i think it was maybe in 08 and and we were we were already past that <laughs> you know that mm -hmm. stage of things but but there's um there's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, good books and uh, people need to find out you know find out what the, the, you know there's so many different symptoms that somebody can have that you really have to do you have to become a researcher the parent has to become a researcher and so you know some some children, you know, Rachel's had, had a variety of symptoms, but her main ones had to do with musculoskeletal pain. But there are people that have total different, you know, different set of symptoms. And so you really have to, to zero in on, on what you need. So you have to become an academic researcher. You have to, you have to become a, a activity director. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough and you need to find support and you need to find information mm -hmm. and you need to believe your child I think is, is the, the bullet points. And you need to be their advocate. Yes, definitely. definitely. It impacts every aspect of life, doesn't it? It does. It does. And so what would you both like to leave people with from your heart, families and, and young people affected by these infections? I, I mean, you know, it's like just like kind of reiterating what I said earlier, do find something that you can do right now because this isn't a quick, easy fix, but I am proof that you can go from a really low place to a really, really good place. And I'm in a place now of, of pretty consistent good health. And, um, and so it's like, it's so easy to say, oh, have hope. But I mean, just, just like, I like to tell, I like to share my story to show people that it can really get better. And you just kind of got to keep, keep swimming until it does. Persist, yeah. Thank yeah. you, Rachel and Dorothy. Well, I would I would agree with that too. And actually, something that Rachel posted on her Instagram recently was the phrasing. I think was leave space in your mind that there's that that your future can get better. And that's not exactly how she said it, but that was that was the gist of it. And one of the things that was was really hard for her. And, and us was that when she was in the worst of that, she didn't believe that she had a future. And, and she just, we couldn't, she'd get angry with us if we talked too far in the future about anything. And it was, um, I just, that I, you know, leave, leave space. Do you remember how you said it? I don't remember it? how I worded it. It was really <laughs> well worded though, but, but it was something. <laughs> It had something to do with snowboarding and like, you know, at least face it, it'll be you up on that mountain one day, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but it was that, you know, cause it's, you know, it's one thing to tell people to have hope and I, and I would want them to have hope, but I do recognize that when you're feeling hopeless, when if somebody just tells you have hope, exactly, and, and that's, that's no, not all that, it's not very helpful. That's not very helpful. But uh, that was sort of a different way of 
putting it, leave space for the possibility that things can get better. Yeah. And, and that there are stories, certainly Lyme Awareness Month, there tends to be a lot of people coming out with their stories of, and we include many of them in our weekly newsletters, uh, of, of how how they got well, what, what their story was and, and how they got well. And that can be inspiring to, to hear or, you know, just to recognize, hmm, they did it, I'm going to do it. So. That's awesome. Leave space for the possibility. Um, yeah. I think, I think that will resonate for people. And I want to thank you both for your generosity of time and contribution and um, telling people's stories does make a difference. So um, all gratitude from Lyme disease in Australia. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate it.